A priest called him a simple man with nothing extraordinary about him, but nevertheless a saint. He was dismissed from the major seminary because of failing marks. Well, if he couldn't become a priest, he'd be a brother. When John shared this decision with Father Bally, he informed him he would not become a brother, he'd study with him. And so they began again. When John took the test again, he failed miserably. Father Bally pleaded he'd be tested in Ecoli, where John had confidence. John passed. He entered the subdiaconate. A priest present at his ordination testified, I had the good fortune to be very close to Abbe Vianney that day. His face was radiant. Inwardly, I applied to him the verse, and you, child, shall be a prophet of the Most High, thinking to myself, he has less knowledge than some others, but he will do great things in the sacred ministry. When at last he was given his final examination, all his years of prayer, persistence, courage, and loyalty paid off. August the 13th, 1815, John Mary Vianney was ordained a priest, truly another Christ. He best described what it meant to him. Oh, how great a person is the priest. The priest will truly only understand himself when he gets to heaven. If we understood what the priesthood means, we would die, not from fright, but from love. Abbe John Vianney was appointed curate to Father Bally, and the next two and a half years spent long hours praying, practicing penance, and studying church doctrines with him. With the help of the Holy Bible, the lives of the saints, and the early Desert Fathers, they were able to live a life that would terrify most of us today. They fought not only their French love for food, but the barest needs of comfort in the flesh. When their extreme penances were reported to the Chancery, the response was, people of Eccoli, you're fortunate to have priests doing such penance for you. But in December 1817, the little curate administered last rites to his pastor, teacher, and friend, Father Bali. Eccoli was unaware of the prophet in their midst. The new pastor felt there was no need of an assistant. Less than two months after his friend's death, John Vianney was sent to ours. The priest who assigned him prophesied, there isn't much love of God in that parish. You will put some love of God into it. Ours, more a mission than a parish, was impoverished materially and spiritually. The people were not hostile to the church, they just didn't care. No one, with the exception of one devout lady, wanted a priest or a church in ours. The townspeople claimed the village was far too small for one church, but not for four taverns. Mm -hmm. And this is where the curé was to practice his ministry. The curé Vianney, who walked towards ours, looked older than his 32 years. His emaciated frame was topped by auburn hair which would turn prematurely white. As he asked the young shepherd the way to ours, the curé spoke of his purpose for coming there. You have shown me the road to ours. I will show you the road to heaven. Over the years, his parishioners overheard him praying as he prostrated himself before the Blessed Sacrament. Dear God, I beg you to convert my parish. I am willing to suffer anything you want as long as I live. People came from far and near to hear the curé. Like Jesus, he used the countryside and things familiar to them and himself. Souls were touched, their hearts pierced by the arrow of the Father's love that sailed through the air as he preached. He loved them and they loved him, and it was this love that converted them, more than even his arguments. If it is true the best preacher is one who loves God most, then surely that would have to apply to the curé of ours. <laughs> 